In the fall of 2022, Transit Police became aware of a network of individuals associated with the British Columbia gang conflict, whom we suspected of trafficking illicit drugs into municipalities throughout the Lower Mainland, and that these drugs were distributed using the transit system. It was quickly determined that these suspects posed a risk to public safety due to their access to firearms. On May 2, 2023, as a result of the investigation, Transit Police executed three simultaneous residential search warrants in three different municipalities. While executing these warrants, the following items were seized. Ten firearms of varying caliber, some with illegal modifications. 3,800 rounds of ammunition. Illicit drugs packaged in a manner consistent with trafficking, with an estimated street value of $70,000. Approximately $50,000 in counterfeit Canadian currency and a 2017 Mercedes C300, which was believed to have been purchased using criminal proceeds. Also located at one of the residents was a psilocybin or magic mushroom grow operation that was dismantled and seized. Four suspects have been arrested and additional arrests are anticipated. The investigation is still ongoing. We are committed to public safety and we want to send a clear message. If you use the transit system to commit your crime, you will be arrested and face criminal charges. Thank you. Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Amanda. <clears throat> Surrey RCMP and Metro Vancouver Transit Police have worked together closely for many, many years towards our common goal of delivering public safety to our communities, both in our neighborhoods and on the transit system. We achieved this through combined patrols, shared intelligence, officer secondments, and joint investigations such as this one. I would like to commend the police officers of the Transit Police Crime Suppression Team for the successful investigation. These arrests and seizures have had a positive impact on public safety in our communities. Multi-jurisdictional drug trafficking investigations are complex, require both time and resources to complete. As part of our ongoing close relationship, Transit Police asked the Surrey RCMP North Surrey Community Response Unit to assist with this investigation, which we did over the course of several months, accumulating in the execution of one of those three search warrants at a residence in North Surrey. This project showcases the interoperability between police officers from multiple agencies that we have in the Lower Mainland, and our capacity to make our communities safer and stronger by working together Surrey RCMP and Transit Police continue to work closely together every shift, preventing crime, uh, providing public safety, holding those criminals who go against this to account. Thanks, Sergeant, Thanks, Sergeant Pronger. Uh, Dave Jones, Chief Officer of the Transit Police. And I just want to extend my thanks and gratitude to the Surrey RCMP Crime Reduction Unit North, the RCMP Lower Mainland District, the Combined Forces Special Enforcement Unit of British Columbia and the Vancouver Police Department. All of these agencies were either involved throughout the investigation or on the day that the arrests and search warrants were executed. Addressing crime and safety in and around the transit locations is an important focus of efforts. Being visible and responding to calls for service on a daily basis reflects the core work that every police agency does. There is, however, a time when we need to address serious matters that are possibly less visible to the public, but have a nexus to the transit system or the transit hubs. Our commitment to making the transit system safer is, is to work and look at all levels of criminal activity in conjunction with our jurisdictional partners, and in this case, the Surrey RCMP, to ensure that the systems and transit hubs continue to be places of safety within each community. Thanks, Amanda. Okay, now we'll open up to questions. Yes. I'm not sure who this would be directed to, but when you say illegal modifications to the guns, can you elaborate on that? Uh, I'm not a gun expert, but from what I gather, the modifications were done to the um, cartridges that go into the firearms themselves. So anything over five rounds is considered restricted and it's not allowed. So it was modified to accept more rounds of bullets than five. And do we know yet? Or, or 
Uh, that will all form part of the investigation. I don't have the history of the guns themselves. Uh, they come from different residences, and there are varying degrees of, of age. There's one gun on there that's probably from, I was told, World, World War II, so it's pretty old. Uh, I cannot list them uh, exactly for each person, but we have recommended charges for firearms possession, um, trafficking for the uh, magic mushrooms, and a couple of other um, breach charges are included in that as well. Are you the local gun expert? Okay. Uh, I, I can okay. I certainly address that. Uh, just from a, a, a brief inspection, um, this is a selection of firearms that range from uh, non-restricted to restricted. Uh, they are, some of them are 22 caliber uh, rifles, which uh, can be lethal uh, to, to people. They're uh, very dangerous weapons. Uh, there's a 12 gauge shotgun, uh, also a very powerful weapon. And then there's a range of hunting rifles as well. Uh, so depending on the, uh, the actual caliber of these weapons, uh, they are very dangerous if they're in the wrong hands. The federal government uh, has been trying to crack down on gun and gun these sorts of weapons. How are, is there any insight into how these criminals are, are obtaining these guns? I don't want to speak to um, portions of the investigation that are still under investigation, and I'm not fully briefed on uh, the provenance of, of a lot of these weapons. Uh, some of them uh, may be registered. As I said, uh, a non-restricted weapon is, uh, is lawful to be possessed by someone that uh, uh, has the required firearms license. Uh, so again, it's, it's not the actual uh, weapon itself. It's, it's that, that usage um, where, which provides that risk to public safety, particularly when it's being combined with uh, drugs, um, organized crime networks, um, and the BC gang conflict. Uh, that, that's the issue. It's, it's not so much whether the, the gun itself is uh, um, its, it's a exact classification, it's, it's the use that that gun's going to be put to. Not speaking to this specifically, but with the BC gang conflict, is the biggest concern from a police perspective in them obtaining guns is that from the states? Is that, is that the biggest concern right now? I'm not going to speak to that again. It's a bit outside the, the spectrum of, of, uh, of our media conference here. Um, that we have a concern about any firearms in the hands of criminals, uh, regardless of its provenance, where it comes from. And will you be revealing the identities of those arrested at all? So right now, all of the suspects have been released, uh, and they'll be compelled to court. And once they've been char formally charged with their offenses, their names will be released. I think just to, to get into that is that um, people best positioned to answer that might be out of the combined forces unit at this point in time. What this file uh, exemplifies, however, is the combined effort and the fire, some of the funding that came from this comes through provincial funding to address the gang issues or things around the BC gang conflict. It allows us to conduct projects, commit the resources and put um, I would say the effort forward in terms of it. So from our perspective, the issue is, is that there is the funding, the resourcing, and that available to address it. Like anything else, what we know of, we can address. What we're aware of, we can address. So if there was a part of that was to say, there's always those opportunities for someone to come forward and you know provide us that bit of information that will allow you know, police to take positive action. I don't assume that any of these weapons here were being possessed for what I would call a, a lawful purpose at the time in terms of it. But as for the overall temperature, 
you know, we're committed and all police agencies across the province are committed. And we recently saw federal funding that again was renewed here recently. I believe it's in the tune of about $54 million that came for gangs and guns from the province. That is up from the 32 million that was previously committed by the federal government towards initiatives such as this. And with that type of funding and the commitment of resources, what I can assure people is that what we're know of, what we're aware of, and what we're capable of addressing, it will get handled. When you say uh, four people have been arrested and four are likely to be arrested, um, can you give us an, a sense of the scope of this investigation? So an investigation that takes time like this, seven months, eight months, that's a long investigation. So our officers uncover new evidence, new avenues of investigation every day that lead to another suspect that's possibly involved in what is happening here and, and all of these weapons and these guns and all of the things that we've recovered. So it's hard to say how many are involved. It, it's a network that is that stretches far. And for now, we have arrested four, and we do expect more arrests in the future. I can't give you an exact number, but um, it is definitely going to be more than the four. No, go ahead. And just the other substances um, on the table there, in the jars and in the bag that's going to be list off? Yes, so those are the psilocybin mushrooms, um, and that's how they're packaged, and that's how they're grown. They're, they're grown in, in the water, um, and then they cut the mushrooms, and then they're grown sort of individually and then packaged for sale. And there's sorry, there's fent there's fentanyl in the baggies as well. So different different forms of drugs that are prepackaged for sale. Um, there's fentanyl. Um, I think there's also meth, and there's a couple of other drugs in there, but mostly fentanyl. Just, just yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Oops. Good. What would you say the most significant charges? Uh, is it the drugs or the guns? Which are the ones that could maybe just not familiar with? What's the most that could face with something like this? Would the drugs be worse than the guns? Um, that is a question really for Crown. Um, but I think it's the totality of all of the, the items combined. So the drugs plus the guns plus the, the manner of trafficking, all of it. I think trafficking is likely higher on the list of, of those charges, but combined uh, as a totality, uh, that would be up to Crown. Okay. Okay. And maybe just quickly, the, sorry, just one did you want to go ahead? Go ahead. No, uh, okay. What's, what's, the, what's, the, one quick, what's, the, what's the process generally for a firearm? Do you discover it? Do you check the serial number? Is, is it involved in a crime? somebody possess it or purchase it legally, how, what's the, maybe just general, what's the process of finding out if a gun is legal, can be modified, how long does that take? Okay, Chief Jones will answer. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so generally, it, it'll all depend on the uh, crime that it may have been involved with. Obviously, a weapon that is believed to have been involved in, say, perhaps a homicide that where a suspect needs to be identified quickly or the charges need to be dealt with. The general thing when you're dealing with firearms is, of course, to check the origin of it, serial number, ownership of it, licensing of it. And then after that, the firearms will be examined. Um, either in the provincial lab, the BC has developed its own provincial lab with assistance of the province, or the National Firearms Lab. And the firearms lab in the past used to, and I, again, you can check with them on this, used to keep uh, a record of each weapon and uh, the type of uh, round that would come from it to compare to prior crimes that may have been involved at that point in time. So like anything, the issue is how busy those are, the seriousness of it. In the case here, the weapons are off the street, so we have these weapons. You can look at the caliber of them, you can look at the nature of them, you can look at the individuals, you can consider whether there's any urgency or any particular weapon that might draw some greater attention to or need a closer look at in an expedited manner. But at this point here, what I think is the significant part of this is you ask the question about what's more important, the drugs or guns? I mean, obviously we know that firearms for an un... Oh, the significant charges, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, the significant, char significant charges here will always be in the world of firearms these days, right? The firearms, we've seen a new approach to, I'm going to say, drugs to a degree. We look at it that there are... Um, changes to the laws and manners in which we are addressing the issues around the opioid crisis in terms of how we're looking at uh, protecting the vulnerable within our communities and that and not trying to, I'm going to say, victimize them through, I'm going to say, like an aggressive approach on, um, you know, that 
individual use of drugs here, although we still don't have that safe supply system. So we know that there is uh, an environment where it needs to be obtained from an unlawful source, if you want to call it. But when we look at firearms and the damage that's being done to our communities here, the type of unregistered or unlawful weapons out on the streets in the hands of individuals becomes the most serious thing that we need to do because the physical harm that can be created by things such as the weapons you see here before you are the most serious matters for us. Anyways, with that, I do know that we got to run. I'm sure Amanda and uh, Sergeant Pronger can answer questions, hold up items for you here in terms of that. All right. Thanks.